Welcome to the February Team Studio and TLCC webinar. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to introduce my co-host, Paul Delanevia, and today's speaker, Howard Greenberg from TLCC, who will be presenting a notes developer's journey into Java. My name is Courtney. I'm the inbound marketing specialist at Team Studio and your co-host today. Before we start talking about today's topic, I'll be taking a few moments to tell you who we are and what we do at Team Studio. I'll then be passing the controls to Paul Delanebia at TLCC so he can give an introduction, and then we'll dive right into today's topic. To get us started, I'd like to cover a few administrative points. To protect your privacy, the attendee list is not public. All attendees are muted during this session, so you can participate by typing your questions to the speaker inside the questions section on your GoToWebinar window. We're doing Q&A at the end of this session, but you're welcome to ask your question at any point in the questions section, and we'll get to it once the formal presentation has concluded. This session is being recorded, and the link will be sent to you in a follow-up email in a few days. So a little bit about Team Studio. We may have assisted you in the past with application development. We've been delivering innovative developer tools and productivity tools to the Notes and Domino community since 1996, where we specialized in source code control, version management, and source code management. And we moved into the mobile application arena in 2010 with our mobile application platform, Unplugged. The market not only needed this app platform, but it also needed app building expertise. So we offer modernization services to web-enable and mobilize IBM Notes and Domino applications. Unplugged gives you the ability to extend your IBM Notes apps out to mobile devices. It leverages the powerful technology of XPages and provides a native app experience for the user. And these apps have the capability to function when offline. Apps run very quickly and development of apps is easier than ever. We're very proud to have been the recipient of two IBM Collaboration Solutions Awards for Unplugged in 2013 and 2014. In January 2014 at the Connect Conference, IBM awarded Unplugged with the Best of Show and CTO Award. And at IBM Partner World in February 2014, IBM recognized the platform as a finalist for a Beacon Award. This product is available on the major mobile platforms, BlackBerry, Android, and iOS. In addition to Unplugged as a platform, we provide off-the-shelf template apps like Team Studio Continuity for mobile business continuity, OneView for mobile re approvals requests, and Customer View for mobile CRM. We'd be happy to arrange a demo to show you how these tools work. Just contact us directly from our website or by phone. Late last year, we launched X Controls on OpenNTF. This project allows you to quickly create XPages applications by dragging and dropping custom controls into your XPages. The applications you create will work on desktop browsers, mobile browsers, and Team Studio Unplugged. You can download the XControls template from OpenNTF along with a sampler application that shows you how to make use of the different controls to build an application. You can learn more at xcontrols.org. Here at Team Studio, we offer professional services that can provide you with the resources you need to meet project deadlines. Our services such as the Unplugged Developer Assistance Program, Application Upgrade Analysis, and Application Usage Auditing can help you work more efficiently with fewer errors. Learn more by visiting teamstudio.com forward slash solutions forward slash services. The IBM Notes application usage auditing tool from Team Studio allows you to track user activity of Notes databases with an automated process. Now through March 31st, 2015, if you sign up for a demo of usage auditing, you'll be entered to win a Nexus 6. Just click on the banner on the Team Studio homepage. Lastly, we'll be at Engage next month in Belgium. Stop by and say hello for a chance to win an iPhone 6. And with that, I'd like to pass the presentation on to Paul uh, so that he can talk a little bit about TLCC, and then we will dive into today's topic. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Courtney. And thanks to everyone for joining us today in today's webinar. And am I sharing my screen? Yep, that looks uh, yeah. good, Paul. Okay, so today's webinar, a Notes Developer's Journey into Java. I'll be your host. My name is Paul Delanebia, and Howard Greenberg will be presenting his journey into Java today. 
First, a little bit about TLCC. We offer a complete curriculum, curriculum and self-paced courses for XPages development, domino development, ad, domino administration, and notes user courses as well. We offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring services, and we deliver private instructor-led classes. We can deliver those on-site at your location or in a virtual classroom. Finally, we offer application development and consulting services. Our specialty is XPages development, but we also uh, provide support in domino development and domino administration as well. Today's topic is Java, and Howard's going to be presenting on Java collections and Java beans and managed beans. And if you'd like to learn more, we have two excellent courses which are on sale until March 15th. Our Java 1 for XPages development course covers the Java language and syntax, some of the core classes, and Java collections, like working with Java arrays and vectors and maps. In our Java 2 for XPages development course, we cover debugging, the different ways of doing that, the expression language, Java beans, managed beans, and we also show you how to use third-party libraries like Apache Poi to export Domino data into an ex into uh, an ex Excel spreadsheet, or Apache FOP to produce a PDF from Domino data. Our Java 2 course is on sale for $5.99, and you can get both courses in our Java for XPages package, which is on sale for $9.99. Our next webinar is scheduled for March 17th, and I have the privilege of co-presenting that one with Oliver Busi. Oliver will be presenting on the jQuery data table, and I'll be presenting on the Dojo data grid, two alternative approaches for displaying your Domino view data. We will have a Q&A at the end, as Courtney mentioned, and you can post your questions into the questions area as they come up while Howard is presenting, and I'll give them a voice at the end during the Q&A session. If you're not seeing your full interface, look for the little ribbon and click on that orange arrow to expand it. Okay, so Howard, if you can join in as I introduce you and maybe take over the presentation. So Howard Greenberg is my partner here at TLCC. We founded TLCC 17 years ago, quite some time ago. And we've been delivering notes and domino training, Lotus Script training, Java training, as those different components were added into the product. Uh, Howard is an excellent developer and programmer, and he's been recognized as an IBM champion for I, since, I believe since that program began, um, some four years ago. Is that correct, Howard? Uh, correct, Paul. I think it's been four or five years. Yeah. So um, my privilege to introduce Howard Greenberg. Howard, what are you going to show us today? Well, thanks, Paul, for that uh, nice presentation and uh, introduction, I should say. And my power just flickered here. Um, so uh, hopefully it will stay... Eddie, uh, and you're seeing my screen here. Uh, yeah, we're seeing my, that, Howard. My second screen is not on a battery backup, so if it happens again, uh, I might have to quickly uh, uh, move everything to the main screen, and then we'll see how long the battery backup lasts, which won't be too long. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Uh, so as Paul mentioned, um, Paul and I have been doing this notes and domino thing, if you want to call it that, for quite a while. And uh, we were instructors when release 4 came out with Flodescript, and that was, I would say, for both of us, probably our first big introduction into an object-oriented uh, programming language. So like many of you, I think, you know, you probably started with notes and, and kind of then started working with Flodescript, which, you know, and, and, and many of us, it, when we worked with Flodescript, started using the object-oriented capabilities um, of Flodescript. And, and even if you didn't consciously do that, you probably used the object-oriented just whenever you access the domino objects, because those are just objects. Um, some of you uh, who have not really you know, tried out Java in domino might not even remember or be aware that Java has been in uh, domino since R5. And so I have used, you know, Java agents and web services and 
And then with X pages, I've done a lot more Java, but I haven't really done, I would say, what, what I would call a production uh, managed bean, where I actually created a managed bean that I actually, you know, put into production. I kind of played around with it, but not really did anything uh, serious, I guess you could say. So I think that a lot of you have a similar background. Hopefully you have a little bit of introduction to object-oriented programming, at least in Lotus Script. Um, and because uh, that's kind of what I'm basing the uh, the audience at, and based on my conversations with many people over the years, uh, I think a lot of people, you know, are, are kind of at that Lotus Group level. Um, so let's uh, get started. And so what I'm going to take you on today in my journey, my first project was our TLCC catalog that many of you have probably seen, and. Rather than see a slide, let me just jump right into what it looks like. This is actually the old version before using a managed bean, and it looks exactly like the one today that uses a managed bean because what we really changed was just under the covers. So uh, let me explain a little bit how this works and why I wanted to improve upon it um, and, and move to a managed bean. Uh, first of all, you can select on the left side what version of Domino you want to find courses for, and that will reload you know, the courses that you see. That also will reload what topics you see here, because not every version, like if we go down to 8.0, there's no X pages in 8.0, so we have a different set of courses, and the old DB2 feature is gone. That was last seen in 8.0. So we have to reset this list of what I'm going to call categories. Uh, for today's discussion. So this list of categories of courses we have to reset whenever we change a version or change the whether you want to see developer admin or uh, all courses. So um, then when you if you want to drill down further and let's say you see want to see the Lotus script courses um, then we have to again reset uh, what you're looking at in the middle that shows all the information about the courses is uh, uh, all done in a repeat and repeating uh, table rows. So the repeat control has to then uh, calculate again uh, what courses to show. And so I wasn't very happy with the way I did it, which uh, let me take, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to give you a rough idea of what we were doing before. Uh, so everything, all the courses, of course, being uh, Domino developers, and we, you know, all our site is driven by Domino, and all our courses are in a Domino database, and so of course we have a Domino view. This is in the order that I want to show the courses to the uh, person viewing our web page. So, um, what I do in the uh, old version of the um, of the X page was the repeat would figure out, okay, what courses do we want to see, and then loads them up into the repeat, uh, kind of going through them one by one. Uh, so this is our view, and so in the new version with the managed bean, I'm going to still use the same view, but I'm just going to use it, uh, as I explain later, uh, to initially load a bean, and then from that point on, we won't access the dominant view anymore. Okay, so the X page itself uh, as you can see, here it is in Designer, um, and uh, what I did uh, for the version, it's actually just hard-coded, uh, just to make it easier back then, I just hard-coded that, as well as the admin and developer. Um, when we first load the X page, we have a, uh, a function we call in uh, server-side JavaScript in the uh, library that uh, I also call whenever I change versions. And so what I did to get all those categories, uh, they can be either developer categories or admin categories or both, I just uh, set up a session scope variable. So I went to a view and, and basically walked through the view entry by entry and put created an array that I loaded into a session scope variable for the admin courses and did the same thing for the developer courses. And then uh, for all the courses, I just concatenated those together into another session scope variable. So that happens whenever we change versions. So that's a, a fairly uh, processing uh, intensive task. Then whenever uh, the user, uh, the list of, uh, I should say, the list of, uh, of categories that they see 
is just going to load from those session scope variables. Uh, so we have, uh, in this case, it's like a combo box. It's a dojo filtering select control. Um, and it's just going to load the choices depending on what the user selected. If they selected developer or admin or, or both, it'll just load the sessions from uh, the uh, categories, I should say, from those session scope variables. So nothing uh, too complicated there. But then in my repeat control, that's repeating uh, the table rows, I have a fair amount of code that, depending on what the user selected on the left side, is going to go through a view and one by one load up what should be in the repeat into an array list. So I initialize an empty array list. And uh, depending on what the user wants to see, we're going to loop through one by one adding uh, to that array list. So every time the user changes something on the left side, it's a fairly uh, processor intensive task to go to the domino view and figure out what to show. And if they select a category, then we do, uh, I think down here, a full text search. And, and then the results of that full text search we load into that array list to show you know, the courses. So that was a fairly uh, uh, time consuming process. It actually, believe it or not, uh, if you go to, you know, well, it's hard for you to go to the other website now, so you just can see the new version. But as I, as you see, um, it's hard to tell what the delay is when you go through a good webinar, but it actually does happen pretty quickly. And I think that's something to be said of the people at IBM who developed X pages. Things, it is a very fast performing um, website, even when you do some kludgy programming like I was doing. So anyway, that's just the, uh, way, the way it worked uh, before. So really what I wanted to do was to improve the performance. I wanted to avoid accessing any domino views whenever the user changed something. I wanted to load it all from memory uh, using a Java Bean to control what courses get displayed. So that's uh, one of the goals. The other goal was, uh, a lot of the pieces before were kind of interconnected. And if I wanted to take the catalog and then come up with a mobile design, maybe move to the X controls or um, uh, move to a bootstrap layout, um, it, would, it would be a, a lot of work to kind of um, duplicate a lot of the, the processes and a lot of the things I had to make everything work. Now with the Java Bean, it's, it's really a piece of cake to go to a different environment because uh, I greatly simplified how um, the Bean interacts with the X page to get the right courses and the right categories and, and things like that. OK, so I kind of knew I wanted to do a managed Bean. And the idea was to kind of just load everything from memory. Uh, that Obviously, you don't want to do that when you have 10,000, a catalog of 10,000 things. I mean, we have you know probably a hundred courses that I'd I'd be wanting to put into memory, so that's not too you know very memory intensive at all. But you know, keep in mind that the idea of using the managed bean in uh, is that you want to um, have something that interacts. In my case, the load from memory. Now, you know, of course, your managed bean might be different. Maybe your managed bean is just then going to go off and pull data in from a Domino document or pull in information from a relational database or, or whatever, it, and then it, it might perform that work of pulling the information in at the time you access uh, the Bean. But as I said, in my case, my goal was to have everything memory resident to speed things up. I also wanted to uh, make it a little more uh, less hard coding. So for the different types of courses, uh, I pull all that in from the Bean as opposed to just hard coding in admin or developer. So if we wanted to add another type of course, we could do that and not change any code and figure out what categories exist for each uh, version as well. Then when it comes down to getting the courses, I want to pass to my repeat a collection of courses for, you know, I have a number of different cases when I want to get all the courses for a specific version or maybe just a uh, developer courses for a specific version or maybe I want to actually get the X pages courses for Domino 9 and drill down that way. So I want to be able to return back to the repeat just by calling the manage bean and have it return all the courses, a collection of all the courses that I need. 
And then for each course, I need to you know, be able to uh, provide the information, such as a name and a price and a quick description and some other you know, basic information. So just uh, kind of a reminder, uh, the, I'm not actually trying to duplicate the entire catalog page. What we do is the user clicks on the title of the course and they can go to another page that actually loads from a domino view and, and has rich text and graphics and stuff like that. Uh, this is strictly the, um, the actual page that you see with the listing of courses. Okay, so uh, let me get into a little bit of, um, of just definitions. We covered this actually in the, in the December webinar with uh, Mike McArrow and Graham Akers, but I'll repeat it here uh, quickly. Uh, and that's also uh, what Graham and Mike did was another way of approaching a managed bean and the way they created one for, in their case, a shopping cart. Uh, so if you get a chance and you didn't see that webinar on December, I put the link in the uh, chat. You can access it there. Um, it's available on our website. So the definition of a managed bean is just a Java class that will use what we call getter and setter methods to access the property elements. Uh, typically, the Java Bean is going to have many different objects, and you're just going to provide some common interfaces to make it easy to access the information in those objects. Uh, so to be considered a Bean, um, what we're going to have is all our uh, variables that we're going to store our data in, we're going to define those as private, and those are called properties or fields. And then we're going to create uh, methods that are public uh, they're accessible from anyone using the bean that start with get or set. So we use the, uh, let's say we want to access the name, we would say get name. If we want to set the value of that name variable, we would say set name. And then we use is for a Boolean value. So uh, all our uh, Java beans are going to have gets and sets to interface with the data. Also, then your class has to implement the serializable interface to be considered a bean. And this is important for XPages because uh, XPages uh, will stay resident in memory, but the XPages engine, if memory starts getting full or the user has too many sessions, uh, it will move them to disk. And when they're moved to disk, then they need to be serializable, meaning they can be written out to disk. The, uh, because of that, that's one thing you don't ever want to do is put any sort of domino object. Uh, you don't want to store it in a bean. You can access your domino objects, get the information, store them in your bean, but you don't actually put a domino document and store it in the bean and expect it to be there uh, if the bean were to get written out to disk or the X page were to get written out to disk. The same is true with your scope variables. I know some people have ran across that. They try to store a domino document in a session scope variable, uh, that's not going to work. So you can store information from the document, but you can't store any domino object into any sort of uh, scope variable or bean. So just a, a pointer there. OK, so here's a picture uh, of a, a, a sample bean, a simple one. Uh, so we define our uh, name of our class, demo bean 322. Uh, implements serializable. So that's the requirement I was talking about, that it has to implement the serializable uh, interface. And when you have a, something that's serializable, you have to give it an ID, which is what the serial version UID is. I'll show you how to create that in Eclipse very simply. Then we have our actual variables on lines 9, 10, and 11, first name, last name, DB title. These are marked private. So when you access this bean, you can't get to just first name by itself. So how do we get to it? We use the getter on line 13, get first name, and inside that method, it just returns the first name uh, variable. If we need to set that value, we use a setter. And that obviously you know, does the same thing, sets the uh, whatever parameter we passed in into that variable. Uh, so that's the public getters and setters I was talking about. These are the private properties. So that's the uh, kind of a, a, a way the bean gets laid out. So now what's a managed bean? So what I just talked about was a Java bean. 
a managed bean is is a Java bean that we're going to define in uh, what they call the runtime framework. The reason I didn't say define it in Domino is because Domino X pages are built on the Java server faces engine, and that's present in other Java application servers like Apache Tomcat or WebSphere. So those environments probably have, have their way to register a managed bean. In XPages, we're going to register the managed bean in the faces config file. Once we do that and we access our, our X page in that application, uh, we're going to then use the getter and setter methods to call the bean. So we don't have to actually instantiate an object variable for the bean. Uh, we just can use, let's say, in the previous slide, my bean was called, um, uh, well, this, it depends on the name in the faces config file, but let's say we called it demo bean 322 in the faces config as well. Uh, we would just call it demo bean 322.get first name, and that will return the first name value. The, um, uh, other than that, the Java bean and the managed bean are exactly the same. Uh, and you don't always need to use a managed bean. The idea of a managed bean is that the, uh, the management of that bean is handled by the XPages engine, and that will initialize it and, uh, and follow whatever scope you gave it. So you can give it an application scope, a session scope, uh, your view scope, or request scope, any of the scopes that we can use for the session or the uh, scope variables, we can define for the managed bean as well. And so it's a lot less work for you, and if you give it something like a session scope, uh, then it will be for that user for the life of the session, and that bean will exist. And you don't have to worry about init you know, initializing it or instantiating it. Um, it will just be there. But lots of times we just need to call some Java to do something, and then we don't need to, uh, to access it again or to save any data in the bean. And so in that case, don't use a managed bean. Just use a regular Java bean and instantiate the Java bean, uh, get a, uh, a variable uh, for the bean, and then you know, do whatever you have to do for processing, and, and then you're done with it. Okay, so getting back to um, uh, my specific project, I kind of listed out some of the objects I thought I would need to pull this off. And I have it on a slide, but it, you know, it actually probably took a day or two of thinking. And as I was thinking, I was researching on some of the Java documentation online, trying to figure out, OK, uh, obviously I need to start off with a object to hold the course. And that's going to hold some details about the course, like the name, the price, uh, course code, a description. But then I somehow need to uh, have a grouping of courses that would be part of, let's say, the X pages courses for release nine. That and those X pages courses are, you know, be something that a developer wants to see. So I need to then kind of compartmentalize a group of courses. So I figured I needed a course list. Uh, object to hold a group of courses that are related to each other. Then um, I was thinking, okay, now uh, I have a number of different categories. So for uh, developer courses, I might have XPages, Java, and LotusScript. So for each one of those categories, I want to assign it the course list that holds the courses for that category. So that was the category table that I was thinking I might need to hold my categories and be able to pull in, okay, give me all the X pages courses in this categories table, and then give me then a collection of the courses that are in that category. Then moving up, uh, uh, my categories are either developer categories or admin categories. So I needed to have another table, a type table, that holds a categories table for um, the categories for that type. So I might have a developer type table, and in that developer type table, it would hold a categories table that has all my categories. And then finally, above that, I have a version table that holds uh, a type table for each version. And so, as you can see, there's quite a hierarchy. And so for today's discussion, let's forget about versions. We just got one version, version 9, and uh, just to kind of make it a little easier for you guys, because 
uh, one thing I will point out is it as you're once you start coding and you're starting to think about where to put things and how to access things, um, I had this kind of sketched out on paper, and, and that really helps a lot to be able to, okay, let's stop for a second, look at my scrap paper, and how does everything relate to each other, and what exactly is it? Because uh, you kind of sometimes get to that point where you kind of get a little lost in your own in, in your own uh, plans, I guess you could say, and then being able to look at that paper and level set and say, oh yeah, this is what I'm trying to do, and this is what I'm trying to get uh, helps a lot. So sketching it out on paper is good. Um, definitely want to think about this before you start writing any code at all. So uh, for my, uh, just to kind of look at it uh, another way uh, in terms of uh, uh, graphically, uh, starting off with a course, so each course has a name, price, uh, description. We're going to put a group of courses in a course list, which I decided would be an array list. Array lists are good because you can feed those into a repeat very easily and then have it repeat through whatever is in that array list. So my course list object has an array list that holds my courses. And then uh, that uh, course list object I put into a category table. In the category table, I decided to use a linked hash map Java object. The reason I did that is because those can have a key value pair. So I can say, give me all the X pages courses, and the value will be the courses list for that X pages category. So it makes it easy then to you know get a certain category by using the key, and it will return the value. And again, the value would be a courses list of courses. And then the category table, once I built that up for, let's say, all the developer courses, I put that into a type table, again, a linked hash map. So I can say, give me all the developer courses. It will return the one category table that has all my categories that holds all the courses and so forth down the line. So um, well, what we're going to do is kind of uh, start coding that and kind of I'm going to walk through the code and, and be brave and, uh, and, and code live. But let me first uh, describe um, one way that I initially did this. And so I'm sure many of you, I think everyone knows Domino Designer is built on Eclipse. But Eclipse is and, and originally was a Java development platform. So that is all still there. Uh, and the way you can access it is go to the Java perspective. So why do, am I telling you this? Well, to, if I were to start creating my managed bean in X pages, I would have to uh, define the uh, Java class. That's pretty easy now, especially in Domino 9. They have a Java design element. Uh, but I would have to then set up my managed bean and my faces config file. Not a big deal. But then whenever I wanted to interface with that managed bean, I'd have to go to an X page and create the linkages to the um, managed bean. It, it would kind of make it a lot harder to do my prototyping. So I figured that if I used a Java program uh, that stands on its own, and Java programs have what's called a main method, uh, we'll see that in a second, that I can then use to create some test cases, and I can create all my objects and create the relationships between them and use the Java program, which I can then just output things to the system console. So uh, let's go look at that. As, um, as I said, this is kind of what I did my prototyping on. So to access the Java perspective, you got to go to Window, Open Perspective, Java. And then you're going to get on the left side our Package Explorer Hierarchy and Navigator. So I'm going to stay in the Navigator. And I'm going to create a new Java project. So you don't get that new Java project if you're in any of the Domino Designer perspectives. So that's why I switched over. So I'll create a new Java project. I'll call it a test webinar. And I'll take all the defaults and just click Finish. So here is my uh, new uh, Java project. We got two folders that are empty. One's uh, for source code. And in that source code folder, I'm going to right-click on that and say New Package. It's good to put all your 
Java classes in a package, and it's typically we use for reverse um, DNS, so I'll put in com.tlcc to create a package. So a package is in uh, the navigator, just looks like another uh, subfolder underneath my source. Okay, now I want to create a new Java uh, class, so I'll go to class, and I'll call this catalog bean. So this is the start of my bean. Now, as I said, I want to be able to do my testing uh, and run this as a Java program. To do that, I need to have the main uh, method stub, so I'll click that on. So we'll create the, you'll see that in a second. We'll create an empty class, and in my main, uh, this is what initially runs uh, when I uh, run my Java program, and up here is where I can put or build out, start building out my Java uh, class or my Java bean, I should say. So first, we got to follow the rules. Uh, any uh, Java bean should implement the serializable. So I'll type in implements. I only have to type in IMP and hit control space. It'll fill that in for me. And then I can do control space again. I can type in serializable, SER, hit control space, get a list of options. I want the java.io one, so I'll double click on that. That will automatically add in the import I need and will also give me a warning. So if you notice in the left side here, I have a little warning that says I don't have the ID that I mentioned before that we need. So I can just click on that warning and I can say add the default serial version ID, double click on that, and it sticks in, get rid of these comments here, it sticks in the ID that's required to make it a proper uh, Java bean. Okay, so the next thing I needed to do after this was, remember uh, I said the course is the uh, nucleus, I guess you could say, of all my data. So I'll create a uh, class for my course. Now this is something I'm going to access in the repeat in my X page, so I'm going to make this public. You'll see the vast majority of the um, uh, objects inside my, my Java bean I'm going to make private because they don't have a need to be accessed. Uh, what we're going to do is provide getters and setters at the end to pull in all the information and, and the beans can access that. But as we loop through a list of, of courses, we need to get things like the name and stuff like that. So let me just create a uh, oops, it's public class course. Okay, so that's my uh, object to hold information about a course. Uh, to avoid some typing, I'll save some time. I'll paste in my uh, private properties. So these, this is where I'm going to store the data for each course in these variables. Uh, so now what I need to do is create my getters and setters. So I, here I could type these in. I could say um, public string uh, get name. So I could create my getters and setters this way by typing them in, but Eclipse has this nice little thing that will generate it for us. If I right click anywhere in the editor and go to source, I can go to uh, generate getters and setters. Here are my private uh, fields, private properties, and I can just check on each one of those to create a get and set for uh, those four private uh, variables. And we can say, say if they should be public or private down here at the bottom. I want them to be public. And those are my, my getters and setters uh, that I need to get information for a course. Uh, then the other thing I want to do is, so when I uh, declare a new course object, I could set these one at a time. So I could you know, declare a, an empty uh, course object and then say set the price, set the name, set the description, set the code using those setters that were just created. But I'm going to do those all in one step. When I create a new course, I'm going to have a, a uh, constructor 
that runs. So when I create a new course, I'll just say new course, pass in the four variables for the name, uh, course code, price, and description, and that will set all the values. And, and that's my course object. So still got a little ways to go before we're done with the bean, but let's, let's go ahead and try uh, this. So first thing I want to do is create a new catalog bean object. I'll call it uh, C bean. And again, you can use control space to save a lot of typing. And then I can create a new course just by saying uh, course C is equal to new well, C bean dot uh, new course and let's see we want to pass it actually I'll rather than typing everything in I I got a, a little cheat sheet of in notepad we'll just paste that in okay and the last thing I'll do is test it out so I'll test it out using a getter uh, and using uh, uh, when we want to write to the console when we run a Java uh, program we can just use system dot out dot print line and it will be C bean oops I'm sorry it'll be course dot uh, get name and notice the type of heads there for the object that I created so it makes it nice and easy uh, if you don't see what you did in the type ahead chances are you made a mistake it's kind of my general rule Okay, so I'll save that. I don't have any errors. Uh, I can run it by going to the Run icon right underneath Navigate. Uh, if you can see my cursor, I can click on that, and it will run my Java program and output to the console at the bottom here the name of the course that I created. So that's my course object. So I know my course object's working, and we can take it a, a step further and build that course list that's going to hold a collection of courses. So let's go uh, talk about that for a second. Uh, what I want to make this courses list variable be is, is I want it to hold an array list of courses. So an array list is like an array. I'm sure everyone's familiar with an array. But an array list is part of what's called the collection uh, class in Java. The nice thing is you don't have to set a, si a size. Normally in Java arrays, you got to kind of give it an initial size. But probably the most important thing about using an array list is that <clears throat> there's something in Java called generics. And we can give our uh, collection a data type that it's supposed to be. So in this case, if you look that uh, this array list, I want to hold a course. I'll call it a uh, course list. So it can only hold a course object. It can't hold anything else. And if we try to give it something else, we'll get an error when we go to save it and, and compile our code. So these generics are really great for programming uh, because you're not going to be able to, like in an array, you could then stick anything into the array, which um, uh, later on could cause you problems. This way we're always going to know that our course list uh, is holding uh, courses, course objects. Once we create the array list, we can, uh, there's a whole bunch of methods you can look up and see uh, that's available in the array list uh, class. But one of the two that are useful for me at the moment is to add an object so I can add a new course by saying course list.add and pass it a course object or I can add a add all and add a collection of courses. So that's useful, uh, which I'll use that a lot as we move forward. And as I mentioned before, that the array list are very good in repeats because you can pass an array list to uh, the value property of the repeat, and it'll just repeat over whatever uh, objects are in that repeat, whether they be strings or, uh, in this case, courses so in my uh, repeat then I'll use the get name and get price etc uh, to show the information in the repeat okay so let's go back uh, to um, 
our uh, designer. And let's uh, build another object here that's going to hold the array list of cor courses. So it's going to hold a grouping of courses. So I'm going to say private class uh, courses list. List. Okay, and so in this class, the 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 uh, most important thing I want this class to do is to have an array list to hold the grouping of courses. So I will say private array list, and I'll use my control uh, space again to uh, pull up the array list. And notice now when I do that, it automatically sticks in the left and right angle bracket and puts an E in there. So that's the data type that's going to be in this array list. So if I put in, I want to put in the course, that's the only type of data I want to be stored in this array list. And we'll call this variable C list. Okay, uh, so that's the, um, let's see, I'm getting a warning since I haven't used these variables yet. Uh, that's okay, so we're going to use them in a second. So the first thing I want to do is when we create a new uh, courses list object, I want to initialize it. Uh, so I need to set up a constructor uh, to initialize that array list whenever we create a new courses list. And we'll just initially uh, set it up. It will just be an, an empty array list. So I'll say C list is equal to new array list course. Again, the type ahead uh, helps save me a lot of time. So whenever we create a new courses list, it will create, it will in initialize this C list variable uh, and make it a new empty array list. So now what we need to do is I could set up my getters and setters. Uh, however, my if I go to uh, uh, the uh, generate getters and setters, um, when we go to set it with a generated uh, setter, it's going to um, expect a whole array list of courses. Uh, so I don't really want to do that. I want to add these one at a time as I, as I build these array lists. So I'm just going to uh, set up the getter automatically. So that created it right here. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, when I, what I'm really going to do is add these one at a time. And I should have made this private. So we're never going to use this outside of our class. So uh, what I'm really going to do is um, I want to add a course one at a time. So I don't need this method to return anything. I just want to add a course. And of course, uh, no pun intended, I'm going to pass in a course object. So I need to put in uh, that into my parameters. And then when I do that, I will go to my uh, uh, array list and just say clist.add and add a course, which would be that uh, parameter that I passed in. So this is going to let me, uh, I can call, uh, create a new courses list and then uh, call, you know, the method add course to add a course uh, one at a time. And let's see, that should be it for my, for now, because we want to try it out. Let me just get rid of some white space here. So trying it out, I'm going to need uh, to create uh, another course so we have more than one. So let me do that. Again, I'm going to kind of shortcut here. Let me make this a little bigger. Okay, so what I'm going to do is create two course objects, C and C2. One has our X pages one course, one has the X pages two. Then I'll create a new courses list. And then I'll use that add course that I just created to uh, add the C course. Then I'll add it uh, again, adding the C2 course. Then I'll loop through the uh, the array list. So CL is our courses list object. 
and get C list returns and array list, which we can just look again here, get C list returns and array list of courses. So we're going to loop through that array. And then when we do that, we will just call our, our variable as we loop through it is called temp course. Temp course is a course object. And so we'll just say temp course dot get name. So I'll run that as again Java program and you see that it prints out course name is you know with the two courses that we created. So that's my courses list. And the next thing I want to add, if we remember, is I want to put these courses list into a category table. So the category table uh, is going to hold a number of categories. Uh, categories, again, are like X pages, you know, Lotus script, JavaScript, Java. And uh, those, each one of those categories will have a courses list array list associated with it or a courses list object. I should say associated with it. So again, I'll create a new um, uh, course category table. And actually, before I do that, I, I want to let's get back to the um, let's go back to our slides. And the reason I want to come back to the slides is because the category table I mentioned this before is going to be a linked hash map. Why are we using a linked hash map? Well, the linked hash map will hold a key value pair, meaning that I can say, give me in this category table, give me the X pages category, that's our key, and it will return a value. The value in this case is going to be my courses list, that what we just created. The nice thing uh, about the link cache map is that it will maintain the insertion order. So as I loop through and initially build out the data in my Java Bean, it's going to, uh, I'm going to go through that view and add the courses one at a time to my uh, uh, Java Bean. And I want the courses to stay in the same order as I added them because my view is in the order that I want the users to see it in. So uh, that's one of the reasons I chose the link hash map. Uh, so how do I know all that stuff? Well, you know, I went on the web, of course, and Googled it and learned about Java collections. And I'll show you in a second a, a couple of references that I found that kind of helped me choose what type of collection to use depending on my requirements. Okay, so the linked hash map, like many of the Java collection objects, has a put and get. So if I want to put a value into a linked hash map, I use the put, give it two parameters. One is the key. In this case, it's a string. Uh, you can have other kinds of objects. And the second parameter is my value. In this case, it's the courses list uh, object that I just created. And then if I want to get a value, I can just say get and give it the key, and then it will return the value. Pretty simple. If I want to loop through a linked hash map, I can loop through and get all the entries. So the entries would be that key value pair, and that would be an entry object, or I can get a set of only the keys, which would be, in this case, the string of all the categories, or I can get the values, which in this case would be a set of the uh, various uh, courses list that I, that I put in there. So that can be very handy because I'm going to have to loop through these later on when I start pulling information out of the bean and passing it to my X page. So again, uh, how did I uh, know to use a link hash map? It's obviously, I, I Googled it. I said that. But some of the considerations that you want to think of in terms of what collection you want to use. In Java collections, I should add, uh, the collections uh, framework in Java has dozens and dozens of different types of collections. So how do we choose one? Um, first of all, do we want our data to be automatically sorted? So you can have a collection that has, let's say, a key value pair where the data is always sorted based on the key. And when you insert something in that's new, it will then automatically reorder everything to always keep it in the right order. Uh, so that may be important to you. 
uh, or it might be more important to maintain the insertion order, which is my case. Uh, then another thing is do you want it to hold a key value pair? Some of the collections like the array list don't have the key value pairs. And do you need duplicates? Uh, in the uh, linked hash map, you, your keys obviously have to be unique. Uh, so if you do need duplicates of your data, you want to use an array list. Typically, um, you're going to find that you're going to use array list, uh, linked hash maps, tree maps. Those are the most common, but you never know. Uh, another way to figure this out, this is a really neat uh, um, a chart I found on the web. I think one of the other um, folks, uh, IBM Champions, uh, pointed this out. These uh, articles, we were having a conversation in a chat about Java collections. And uh, this chart is at that first URL at the bottom of the page. Uh, at the uh, second URL at the bottom of the page is a good article about what uh, Java collections to use. But let's go through this for my uh, two use cases that I've talked about already. So first of all, the courses list uh, will start at the top. And let me see if I'll even get fancy with the little tools here on PowerPoint. So we'll start at the top. And so for the list of courses, uh, I just want that to have values only. So we'll go off to the right. And that will be the values. Uh, will they contain uh, duplicates? Uh, not really in my case. We don't have duplicates of courses. i will be a little confusing for people figuring out what course to get. So then I come down here. Is Do I need to remove uh, elements or figure out if a element is in that courses list? Not really. I just want to get a list of the courses. So it points to the array list, which is what I was using. Uh, Let's go uh, for the category table. Uh, here we wanted a key value pair, because I want to be able to say, give me all, let's say, the Lotus Script courses. Uh, the order was important for, for me. And the order was important based on the insertion order. So I went down to the right, and it said I should use a linked hash map. So very nice uh, chart here to help you out, figure out what collection to use. And then once you figure out the name, you just look up the Java documentation on that and, and figure out what to, to go to. OK, so um, let's go back to Designer. Um, I'm not going to uh, I'll build this out a little bit more. And at some point in time, I'll, wanna, uh, I'll stop coding and just kind of show you some of the things in the completed bean to um, make sure we stay on time. So. We wanted to build the category table here. So the category table, um, let me just start building it out. Uh, I say private, let's see, private class category table. And so in this, uh, I mentioned that the Primary storage, we're going to put everything in a linked hash map. OK, and so when I use the control space uh, to get the type ahead, it will, uh, then I insert it in, it will put in a K for key. So my key is going to be a string. And then the value is going to be my courses list. OK, so that's my uh, linked hash map, and we'll call it cap table. OK, so that's my, um, my what I'm going to store the data in, in my category table class. And then um, we want to uh, have a constructor to initialize that. So whenever we create a new category table, um, we want to create, you know, just initialize cat table as a new linked hash map. So it's empty at that point in time. OK, I can use my uh, getters and setters um, to create. Actually, I'm just going to create the getter for the same reason as before, in that the um, get cat table. Actually, I don't even think I want to do that as well. Let's see what it creates. Yeah, so I don't even want to do this. 
where to go. Oh, here it is. So this is what we created. Uh, actually, I don't even want to create that. I take that back. Uh, so what I'm going to want to do here is uh, I want to have a couple of methods. So first of all, I might want to be able to return. I take that back. I do want that. Looking at my notes, let's put that back in. Um, oh, okay, we got that there. What did I do? Okay, that's the trouble with the live demos here. We killed, I accidentally deleted my constructor. Okay. We have that right. No, we had our constructor. Okay, never mind. Start over again. Um, so, actually, let me here just save time. I'll cut and paste it in. Okay, so I want to have a couple methods here. Um, one is, um, let's see what my favorite error is. Okay, so uh, what I did there is I created, let's look at this one first. So I created a get courses method that we pass it in a string, which would be the category name, and that will use the get method on our cat table to return the list of courses, the courses list object. So that was one method I uh, wanted. The other one was I wanted to uh, just be able to get the category table. Um, when I say get cat table, have it return a linked hash map uh, that is our cat table. So if I want to get the linked hash map that has our, our categories with the courses list, I can do that. Okay, so let's uh, test that out. And... Go back to our main and put in our test code. And what did I have? Uh, what do we have here? Our get courses returns. Okay, I think I had missed, I missed one, ah oh yes, oh, there we go, huh? I missed one key method, the fun of doing a live demo. Okay, so one key method that we needed to do, we didn't have any way to add a category. Okay, so obviously when I get, um, when I initialize this, I'm getting a, a empty cat table, but I need to add categories to that cat table. And so what I did was create a method called add Add category, where I pass in the name of my uh, category, like X pages, and then we pass in all the X pages courses uh, that are in a courses list variable, and we use the put method to uh, put that member of the uh, linked hash map in. So that should then, uh, when I run this or test it, let's go explain what we did here. We still created our two courses. We're creating our course list, and we're creating a category table, and we're adding the category here, passing in our key and our category list. So that creates our cat test category table object, and we're going to loop through that by uh, saying cat test dot get courses that returns a courses list get C list returns an array list and each member of the array list is uh, a course so we'll just print out the name so that prints out the same two courses but these are now coming from our category table okay so um, some of the uh, uh, other things I might want to add to this category table is I might want to get all the categories. Um, so uh, that might be something I want to do. Um, let me finish this up. So I'll go back to my category table up here. And I'm going to put in two more uh, methods. 
one is going to get all courses. So rather than have to specify a key, I just want to go through and get all the courses that are in this category table. So that's uh, one thing I want to add. So get all courses, we'll just build an array list. Uh, and then we'll go through, here's where we go through and loop through all the values in our cat table linked hash map. And then we'll use the add all to add all the courses in that one category to our course array uh, list, which we then return uh, back when we call that. The other thing is to get all the keys. So I'm going to get all the keys or all the categories by uh, using the key set that I mentioned before to loop through all the uh, keys as a, uh, as a set. And I'll just use the add all to add them to a new array list, which I return. So get all categories will return a string, uh, an array list of strings of all my categories. And get all courses will return an array list of course objects. So uh, let's just test that out. So really all the code in my main object is the same except my for loop. Instead of uh, that, we're going to uh, test out the get all courses and, and say call get all courses. That should return an array list of courses that I just used the get name on. And so now you know, we only have two courses in there. Actually, uh, I do have, can quickly add some more data here so we have multiple categories. And let's see, what do we have an error on? Get rid of a, okay, so I'll run that. So basically here, that's all I did was add uh, another category of Lotus Script to the X pages that I had, and I'm still using the get all courses. So this should show me all four courses that I have now, even though the, they're in different categories. So just something that's going to be useful later on. Okay, so let me, uh, since we're kind of getting, uh, running out of time, let me go to a completed uh, version of this and just point out uh, one key thing. Because I still haven't built my type table uh, but that's very similar to what we just did with the category table. So if we look over in the outline on the right side, the outline is very useful. You see that this is basically what I've done so far, but I added a type table, which has a, a T table variable. It's a linked hash map that um, we store our types in. And I added uh, some gets and add types and things like that, very similar. But what I want to really point out uh, most importantly is that at the being level, so we had these objects, these type table, category table, courses list, course. But what I really wanted to do was to make it easy, add the methods that you see here, get types, uh, which will go through and get all the types uh, in my Java bean. So this go to a type table and get all the types using the key, get key set or the key set. Uh, the get categories is similar to what I just showed you, but this will do it. It will walk through all the types and, and show me a string of all the categories. Uh, so this one we pass in a type. So I pass in the um, admin or developer. It will show me all the categories. And then what else? Oh, get all courses will show all the courses. So this will just loop through and get all the courses, regardless of what type or category they are, and return those as uh, uh, an array list, or in this case, just a list, which is um, above uh, an array list. Uh, the array list uh, is descended from that. Or I can say get all courses by type, pass it in admin or developer. It will again return a list of my courses, and get all courses by category. I pass it in a type and a category, and it returns all the courses. Again, a list of all the courses. So that's actually the way my Bean is going to interface with my X page, is these methods here, these uh, one, two, five methods that I have. So when I'm going to declare a new catalog Bean, we'll instantiate it with some data. In this case, I had some more fake data in here. 
and we instantiated the data and now all the data is present in our bean and we can use any of these methods to get to that data. So we're kind of at that point now where we want to let me see if I turn this off where we want to pull it into an X page and try it out on an X page. So in, as I mentioned before, uh, managed beans and X pages, we use the faces config XML file and we choose a scope for that. So the scope is going to be uh, like your variables, application scope, session scope, application scopes for all users. Um, they share the same uh, variable or, or Java bean in this case. Session scope is unique for a user and lasts for the length of the session. View scope is for that user for uh, as long as that X page is active. And then request scope is only uh, during the initial request. So we're going to choose a scope for our bean. Uh, and then we're going to initialize our values of the bean. So in my case, I'm initializing the values in the constructor in the bean. But remember, you can't pass any arguments to the bean. So that works in my case because I know that's all I'm doing is going to a domino view and loading up data. Uh, if you actually have to set values in the bean, you're going to want to use a setter. Uh, or another way is you can have something called manage properties in the faces config file. The nice thing is if you have something like a, a, an application scope and you change your bean code, it can detect that your code change and it'll reload the bean for you automatically, which is nice. You don't have to reload you know, the domino HTTP task. This is what we're going to put in the faces config file. Let me just show you that in designer. So I'm going to switch back to uh, our uh, X pages perspective and start working uh, with a domino database again. So I have my uh, demo database. This will make available to you guys. And under application configuration is my faces config file. If you don't have Domino 9, uh, it might even be 9.01 when they surface the faces config under application configuration, you're only going to see this in the X pages perspective, not in the Domino designer perspective. But you can go to Package Explorer and go to uh, Web Content, Web INF, you'll see your faces config uh, XML file. So that, if you have A5 or any version, that will always work by going to the Package Explorer. Here's my manage beam. I gave it a description. I gave it a name. This name is how we're going to reference the, ba the beam in our X page. I gave it uh, the class. So the class here, um, I put all my code. So I, I just basically copy and pasted my code, you know, very high tech, uh, from what I was experimenting with as a Java application. I put it all into my uh, uh, Java uh, design element here and you see uh, actually I don't want to go full screen you see in the outline here let me move that to the left you see that in my outline it's very similar to what we were building before I have my course object uh, my different you know tables and then I have my uh, methods I use to uh, get courses I ended up having to create one to uh, help when I was initializing the data. And then I initialized the data in, uh, in a, a method going to a view and walking through the view one by one. I'm not going to go through that detail because your situation will be different. And that was basically my bean. So I have my Java bean uh, that I made a managed bean by putting it into the faces config file. So now the next thing we need to do is access that being to be able to display the data in our X pages. How are we going to do that? Well, uh, it depends on if you're using server-side JavaScript or not, um, the not being the expression language. So first we'll talk about server-side JavaScript. So my bean before uh, was catalog bean. So I can say catalog bean dot get uh, types and as the example here, and that will return a list of all the types and that's accessing the bean that way. If I want to pass in parameters I can do that. Um, so I can pass in a parameter to the bean to my get call or, or my set call 
and it will return you know whatever it's supposed to return. Ideally, if you are just using a getter to get a simple property, you want to use the expression language. Uh, this will work a lot faster than using the server-side JavaScript. Uh, so here it's a little tricky in that we'll have the B name, but then we uh, won't use a get in front of it or an is. We'll just say the B name dot property name. So in the example before, my uh, my method was get types. So what I want to show would just be catalog bean, the name of the bean dot types. Here's another tricky thing is that even though my Java code was get types with a capital T, uh, I'm going to use a lowercase t for that initial character. The thing with the expression language is you do not have a way to pass in parameters. So you don't supply the parentheses, of course. Uh, and there's no way to pass in a parameter. So you can't use this uh, whenever you've got to pass in a parameter. That's when you'll have to use the server-side JavaScript way. So let's go back to our X page and look at the completed X page. and see how this was used. So uh, again, you're going to get this database. There's one X page in it. So for the audience, um, let me, uh, before I do anything, let me just show the completed uh, X page here, just so you get an idea of what's happening. And it looks a little different than my uh, catalog at my website just because I used a different, um, this is still loading, just because I used a different, um, I used Bootstrap and I took out some of the other things that we had at, at TLCC website that would just make things complicated for you guys when you're looking. Use the target audience and it'll change admin or developer or both. And as you do that, the uh, topics, the categories change. And you see, uh, Probably hard to tell over go to webinar, but it works fairly quickly when I um, move things, you know, change different selections on the left side. Uh, so going back to the X page, uh, on the left side for my, uh, this is a radio button, obviously with the uh, admin developer choice. Uh, I hard coded in both, but I use the expression language and just have my B name, catalog bean dot types to get the different types. Remember types was admin or developer. Then if I want to choose a category, uh, here we have a combo box. And here I use the service. First I figure out what type the user selected, if they picked admin or developer. Because then I call my bean, catalog bean, get categories, and I pass in whatever value the user selected, whether it's admin, developer, or both. So that will show all the categories for um, uh, whatever uh, uh, developer or, or admin that they wanted. Uh, so then we have the repeat control. So the repeat control before was very complicated. I made it a lot less complicated because we just get what the user chose on the left side. So if they chose a category or chose a type, if they chose neither, we just say catalog bean dot get all courses. If they um, only chose a uh, admin or developer, or then we just say get all courses by type and pass in the type. And so remember that returns a an array list of of courses. We'll see how that's used in a second. Or I can say get all courses by category and give it the type and the, and the, the category. Then in my repeat, for example, uh, the label for my uh, link, which is actually the course name. Uh, here I use the expression language. Collection was the repeat variable. And it's repeating over an array list of uh, courses. So you know the method was get CNAME. So I just say collection.cname because I'm using the expression language. But if uh, I go to the price, for example, here I use the service side JavaScript. And I use the, 
collect the collection.get price to get the price. The reason I use server-side JavaScript here is because I wanted to then format the price so it just has you know some nice currency symbol and and no decimal places. Also, I did extend it a little bit beyond what we talked about. If it's a free course, uh, we don't put up a price. We just say it's free, and that's for our demo courses. Uh, so that's how I use it. So you see that my implementation, uh, because I went to the Beam, the Beam's doing all the work of figuring out what to display. We just call up the Beam and and then uh, go from there. So why did we do this um, uh, performance? Uh, on the initial access before, I was at 1.3 seconds. Now I'm at 600 milliseconds, uh, just using uh, very unscientific, using Firebug and, and taking a, doing it a couple times and averaging it together. Before, when I changed the versions, it was 657 milliseconds. Uh, now it's a third of that. Uh, if I change categories, it's about a third of, of my old version before I had my beam. So it's definitely quicker there. Another way to look at this is using the XPages toolbox to profile calls to my Domino backend objects. Before, when I changed versions and went from, let's say, R9 to R85, we had 2,800 calls to um, my Domino backend objects. That took 188 milliseconds. Now, with the bean, I should have theoretically zero, but because I had that at function I was using in my repeat, uh, which is something I, I didn't notice before, that actually is, is making calls to my Domino backend objects, and it made 146 calls. So basically, it went down to almost zero. It's taking zero milliseconds, but uh, it's still calling some Domino backend objects just because I had that at text in there. Well, this is basically um, kind of my journey, I guess you could say, and, and we could also say I think we roasted this beam well done today. Um, so um, we have time for some questions. I'll turn it over to Paul who can um, uh, talk a little bit about how to ask a question and also go over the uh, deal we have if you want to learn more about Java on our Java courses. So Paul? Thank you, Howard. That was very informative. and did receive a lot of um, comments uh, in the question area that it was very informative. Uh, just as a reminder on this slide here, we have that sale uh, until March 15th for both our Java 1 and Java 2 courses and they're both on sale and available in a package. Howard, can you go to the next slide? Many of you are already asking questions. Ask your questions, post them in the questions pane, and I'll give them a voice in a moment. And if you can't see it, just click on that little orange arrow in the ribbon to access your questions pane. And next slide, Howard. Okay, so there are a few questions. I don't know if you want to comment on the upcoming events. Courtney already described Engage, but maybe you can comment on Entwickler. Um, uh, sure, Entwickler. Uh, my friend Rudy uh, puts on a conference in Germany. Uh, he's done this for many, many years. Uh, it's um, a paid event, but he has some great speakers, and it's primarily for uh, German speakers. So anyone dialing in today from Germany, you might want to uh, check that out. It's happening. Uh, in a couple weeks. And then uh, if you are in Europe or want to go to Europe, uh, Theo is having his Engage conference again, uh, which used to be the Belgium user group. And Theo does an excellent job. This is free, uh, two-day event. Some of the best speakers uh, in the community are, are going there. Um, and Ghent is a, a beautiful city. We actually went there after one of the previous Engages uh, as sightseeing. And, and it's, uh, if you haven't been there, definitely uh, uh, worth uh, figuring out a way to get there. I realize it's a little hard for us people in the U.S., but uh, if you're in Europe, it's a free conference with great speakers. I uh, definitely want to try to attend. And so we're ready for questions, Paul. Okay. I have a question from David. Uh, wondering you know, why you're putting the classes inside the Bean as, a, as opposed to creating separate Java classes? Um, good question. 
it, basically all those classes that I created, the category table, the courses list, those are really used internally. And um, so at the end, I showed just those, those uh, methods that we had defined at the bean level that does the work of accessing all those. So if I put them individually, uh, first of all, I would have had uh, uh, multiple Java beans. And not only that, I also should say that, um, that let's say, for example, the courses list. That's not one uh, instantiation of the courses list. I have each category of all our courses has its own list of courses that I put into a category entry in the categories table, and then the categories table gets stuffed in the, the type table. So these kind of all relate, and, they're, and, they're, and, and classes are stored uh, or I should say objects are stored within other objects. So we really just have one type table, and that one type table has um, uh, multiple types, and then each type has multiple categories, and then each category has the value of that has, is our list of courses, which of course is, you know, points to the course. So, so we really hide all that uh, complexity and um, having those methods at the, uh, the bean level, so you just say, get me all courses in the X pages category. And it, it just returns an array list of those courses. OK. Brian asked, um, and I can answer this. He's asking uh, if the slides in the demo database is going to be available. Yes, it is going to be available. Howard's mentioned this, but if, if you missed it, um, you'll receive a follow-up email. All the attendees will receive a follow-up email uh, with links to the slides, the recording of the webinar, and the demo database as well. That, that's correct, right, Howard? Uh, yes, we're going to make the demo database available and then uh, as well as a link to the recording and the slides. Okay, so question from Keith. You know, you've showed us the managed bean. How about an unmanaged bean? So how would you, you know, if you, if you don't have the need for that managed bean in, in any scope, how would you access the Java bean? Uh, what you would want to do um, is you would first, in your server, uh, presumably from server-side JavaScript, so there's an at import uh, that you can use in your server-side JavaScript, and you would say at uh or is it add import package ball? I forget. I think it's add import package. Uh, yes. And you would just say com.tlcc.catalog bean. And then uh, once you did that, you would then have to declare, kind of like I did with the main program, where I had to declare a new uh, instance of the catalog bean. So you'd have to say var, you know, c bean is equal to new catalog bean and then set whatever you know values you need and then you could use that within your code but then once your code is finished executing that that object would go away so that's the the benefit of the managed bean is the object stays for whatever scope that you had defined and you don't have to declare it it's declared automatically when that x page is loaded or in the case of an application scope when that application's uh loaded Okay, so I've got a question from Brian, and you know, what if there's a need for CRUD operations? So what if your, your data is, is more dynamic and you're adding courses on the fly? How do you reload the bean? Okay, well, yeah, adding, uh, adding courses uh, you could definitely do, and I, uh, you could just have another method, you know, add a course and have it add to the right uh, various tables that I had. Uh, so to reload the bean, um, you would have to, um, basically you wouldn't have to reload the bean because your data is all there. You're, uh, in the case of what I was doing was application scope, data is you know, all there in memory, all our courses, we just added one. So the only thing you really have to do is refresh your X page so it would show the new course. Now in terms of CRUD, uh, I mean if you were working with more uh, data that, you know, uh, it's a lot of, uh, some people, I should say, some of the bloggers have talked about where they create a managed bean that will control access to your data. So the managed bean is actually what's interfacing with the Domino document, and when a user 
ask for a certain document, it loads it from the Domino database, and then if they make changes or create a new one, it does the validation happens in the bean, and if it doesn't pass validation, the bean will say this didn't pass and pass back an error uh, to be handled on the X page. Or if you want to write that information out to the uh, Domino application, the bean would actually be what's doing the saving. So that's a technique that some of the you know the folks in the blogging community have done and and they're actually you know people have written some controller classes to do that but um, you know obviously in my case is is kind of more uh, a read-only kind of thing okay quick question from Ovi uh, will we be covering how to write a rest web, rest web service in Java in a future webinar Howard do you have any plans I, uh, well I guess I should ask that of you, Paul, because you and Oliver are going to be working with some um, some constructs that require data in a REST service. So I think Oliver, uh, in the uh, description, said he was going to briefly talk about that, um, creating a, domino, a uh, REST service in Java. And Paul, I don't know if you were going to talk about it or not. Well, not specifically in a Java class. Uh, but we will be taking a look at a REST service uh, example uh, when, when I take a look at the Dojo data grid. Yeah, so I do believe you know we'll touch on that a little bit in uh, in in the March uh, webinar. However, the the intent of that session is more on the on the presentation using these two different, uh, like you said, Paul, the two different um, alternatives um, to uh, using a, a view of control. Okay, how many more you want here, Howard? We've got a few questions lined up. Uh, we take one or two more. Okay, question from Gail. That serialization number that you set to 1L in your Java bean, does that have to be different for every managed bean? Um, there is a way to generate kind of a random number, and I'm not quite sure of the rules. I think it really is only going to matter if you have... Um, the same, like if you have something that's a bean that's session scope and it's for each user, it's not going to matter because each user is running uh, their code and, and it's kind of their own little sandbox, if you want to say that. Um, so I don't think that's really going to come into play, um, but there is a way when you generate that, instead of using the default, to uh, generate kind of like more of a random number. Okay, a uh, question from Slobodan. Is it okay to pass domino objects into methods of a Java bean or instantiate and recycle in the scope of the method? Not declaring them as properties, but using them right directly in the methods? Well, yeah, you, there's not a problem. Let's say if you, um, uh, let's say in my instance, I said, okay, I wanted to get more information about a certain course and pass that back. So I could say, you know, get course whatever, uh, pass it a course code, and in my bean I could then go to my Domino database, pull up that document, get the information, pass it back, and then recycle that Domino document. So um, yeah, that's that's fine, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that I wouldn't want to take that Domino document and store it in a variable in my bean that where I'm thinking it's going to persist because it's not going to persist if it gets serialized to disk. Okay, uh, another question from Slobodan. Uh, can we reuse existing Java classes used by agents or do we have to recreate or duplicate these for XPages applications? Uh, you can't use them from script libraries. Uh, what you could do is move that code to a jar file uh, and then import in the jar file into your agent or import it into um, your X pages. And actually for X pages there is a jar uh, design element that you could bring them in. Uh, for your agents you'd have to bring them in individually. So that would be about the only way to do it I think. Okay and one more question. What's the best pattern to get the note session object into a Java bean or a managed bean? Um, there is, uh, yeah, there is a faces conf uh, 
context, uh, some sort of context.get session, I forget what it is, but you probably can find it on the web. But there is a way to do that, and I think that in Domino 9, there's something that came in from the extension library that makes it even easier to do that. Um, so you probably just Google that. But uh, that brings up another point um, I wanted to make and I forgot. When I was working with the Java program, not with in my Domino application, but when it was a Java program and I was just experimenting, there is a way in, in a Java program, uh, there's a couple different ways to access a Domino database. So even though I was using just fake data, you can access your, uh, basically get a session object in your Java program. So I wanted to mention that because if you do take my approach and do some prototyping or experimentation in a Java program, you are not, uh, you, there is no restriction that you can't access your dominant data. And again, you, just, you can Google that. That just goes back to like R5 days. They've had uh, uh, a couple different ways of doing that. And uh, you should be able to quickly find, you know, uh, some of the different ways, and it depends whether you're accessing it on a server or on your local machine. Uh, on your local machine is a lot easier, and when you do a server, then you just got to call out using a remote procedure call to the server. But it's all pretty easy, and, and as I said, it's kind of makes it easier to prototype when you're working in that environment versus linking to an X page and creating a managed bean and, and that sort of thing. Okay, Howard, I think that is all the time we have. So I'd like to pass on my thanks for everyone for attending, and uh, be sure to catch our next webinar on March 17th. Okay, thank you everyone for attending, and have a great rest of your day.